I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast part of the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and on this edition, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by a very, very special guest. BBC journalist and Guna fanzine columnist Annabel Rackham joins me. Annabel, welcome to the show for the first time. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for having me. No, the pleasure is all mine. It's always good to uh, catch up with fellow Gooners and always good uh, to talk about the club, of course. Um, Annabelle, the, the reason I wanted you to come on the show and, and the reason I sort of reached out was because um, I read your column in the latest edition of the Gooner fanzine and so much of it resonated with me uh, in terms of the way you're feeling about the club at the moment, the way you're feeling about the direction of travel in which we're headed, Mikel Arteta, the job that he's done, the job that Edu's done, and basically just the feeling around the place. It's it's completely different from what it was three years ago, isn't it? Just tell us a little bit about how that journey's been for you in terms of getting back to a place where you can look at Arsenal and go, I'm proud of this. It, it's weird, really, because there's, there's even a massive change from the end of last season to this season. Like, going going to games and being in the stadium, I actually couldn't believe how loud it was. And that made me proud as well, because I feel like rival fans just love to joke about how quiet the Emirates is and, you know, call it the library and stuff like that. And I was like, I lost my voice when I went a couple of weeks ago, like singing all the new songs. They weren't there last season. Uh, the, the team, you know, we were just getting behind the team, cheering every decision. And I just think it's so nice to see. And everyone seems just a lot more united. There's so many more people uh, sort of in the concourses before games. It's not a filing in five, you know, that five minute rush before the game. People genuinely want to be there and chat to their mates and they look forward to games. They look, you know, I look forward to the team sheet coming out. That's such a such a nice experience compared to like a bit of a feeling of dread of not knowing whether like it was going to be David Luiz or Mustafi um, (laughs) at the back, you know, it's it's nice to kind of have a bit of excitement again, I guess. Yeah, for sure. There is, there is plenty of excitement around the place and it just goes to show, doesn't it? Like even when you sort of scroll through social media after a defeat and you find those dissenting voices and the people that are still unhappy and still have questions over the manager and, and, and looking essentially for stuff to be critical about, When you go to the game, you really come to realise that that isn't the general mood, right? It's a really loud minority online. And how do you kind of cope with that from your perspective? Because I find it really draining. As someone who covers the club on a daily basis, like there's times where a result doesn't go our way and I just, I don't even want to look at social media. I felt like that after Old Trafford a few weeks back because I knew that even though Arsenal had gone there and played really well, Unfortunately, we didn't get the result on the day that there were going to be people that said it's the same old Arsenal, it's the same old problems. And I just I've got to a point where I just don't want to hear that anymore. I think, you know, I, I, I'd say that the biggest part of dealing with that was towards the end of last season. So, you know, after the North London derby, after that game against Newcastle, I found like that was probably the hardest point for me. The point at which, you know, a lot of my friends are West Ham, Spurs, Chelsea fans, that sort of thing. That was the point at which people really dug in. And I just said, you know, it feels like you're kind of trotting out the official party line a little bit. But we have like the youngest manager. We have the youngest squads. You know, these are players that some of them have come straight from the academy. Some have come straight, you know, look at Martinelli coming straight from like second division Brazilian football. These are players that have got so much to learn and look how well they've done already. And I think as long as I, you know, watch game, go to a game and I see those green shoots, I see the things that are really encouraging. You know, it's not a flat performance. It's not a performance where nobody's putting in any effort. No one's, you know, fighting challenges, trying to, you know, take on other players as long as I see that that energy and that enthusiasm is there I feel that positivity so after United I, I you know I could still see that we'd played well so I didn't feel kind of as despairing as last season we've had it over the last few years there have been so many ups and downs there have been so many really difficult moments sort of false dawns where we thought maybe the team had turned the corner and then we were kind of pegged back a knock or two 
injuries have been a big, big thing over the last couple of years. I feel like we've been really unlucky in the sense of we've lost real key players at real key moments. And I mean, looking at this season so far, it's been pretty good with the exception of maybe Thomas Partey, who, you know, would have certainly been a starter. But going into this weekend, there are rumours that Alexander Zinchenko's picked up an injury. Yeah. There's talk about Ben White having a bit of an ongoing issue at the moment, which could be something to do with why he's been left out of the England squad, maybe. I mean, I don't know that for a fact, but, you know, that that could be part of the reason. Is there a fear from your side that we're kind of getting back into that territory where we've built a bit of momentum and it's it's under threat because of things like that, which ultimately are, are partly down to bad luck? You cut out at the end. I didn't hear what your last point was that you said. Um, I, just, I heard about yeah. Vinchenko, but not before that. I was just saying that it's, does it feel like we're getting to that territory again where injuries are threatening to kind of, I don't want to say derail us because that would be a sort of premature statement to mm. make, but does it feel like we're getting to a point where everything's going well and this thing of injuries looming over us is a, is a big concern and something that could potentially cause us problems going forward. I mean, we don't have, you know, we're not like Man City where we basically have two players for every position. So there's always a concern with that. I think at the moment, I I feel a bit like worried speaking about it before the Nations League games and the international break because we all know what happened to Tierney playing for Scotland and seeing him get called up. I was a bit like, oh, you know, I don't want him to push himself or play mm. through injuries or anything like that. It's kind of sacrifice himself ahead of, you know, a big run of games in October. So there's always, you know, probably international duty is the thing that's scaring me at the moment. Um, you know, and I know there's been a lot of chat about the disappointment with Ben White. But for me, I'm glad to have a starter that isn't, you know, playing two, three games in the international break and is actually going to get a rest um, because, you know, we really need him. Uh, even with, you know, the gap, the three Gabby's not getting called up. I do think they're players that we're just really going to need to get through October. It's going to be so important going into, you know, that World Cup break with a, in a really strong position. So for me, I'm not worried now. I, I want to see what, you know, what situation we're in after the international break when we go and play those nine games because we need we need everyone. We're going to have to do a lot of rotation. I mean, we can in the Europa League, but everyone's going to be fit. Um, and I think, you know, the club do need to be sensible. And if players are carrying little knocks or, you know, a hit in that red zone, then making sure they don't go away for international duty, they don't go and play those games, especially when, you know, I guess for the European players it's not that they've got a World Cup place on the line. They're not playing for that. They're going and playing in the Nations League. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, looking at this team over sort of the last 12, 18 months and its development and the way it's kind of moved forward, one of the big features of our game is obviously starting with a real high intensity. And I always feel like if we don't get our noses in front in the first half an hour, 40 minutes, then the, the complexion of the game completely changes. And it's a problem that we're not as good at dealing with, I would say. Um, first of all, do you agree with that? And and second of all, does the fact that we've got nine games in October worry you with regards to whether we can maintain that level of energy? Well, I, I'm not sure because I guess there has been games that we have gone behind this season and, and we've come back to, to win them, which is amazing and something we would have never expected last season. So I do think, yeah, it is about... It is about playing well from the start. I think there were too many games last season where we just had really poor first halves. And it was, you know, an aggressive team talk, an aggressive substitution in the second half that made us really change course. I don't think that's been the case as much this season. But, yeah, all pla all players firing on all cylinders from the moment the whistle blows is so important this season. Um, in terms of am I worried about the games? I mean... Our rivals are also playing that amount of games. I know Conte was complaining about Spurs having to play nine games as if it's not the exact situation for Arsenal um, and presumably for like City United, you know, all the all the teams that are playing in, in the European competitions. So I think, you know, as long as the people that we're trying to keep up with have the same problems to deal with, I'm not worrying too much. I guess it's more like, you know, City, United, Chelsea in particular have a lot more squad players 
and can rotate a bit more. But again, you know, we've seen the making of some of our academy players in Europa, Europa League. So if this is a good chance, you know, for people to come and play. Also, you've got people like Marquinhos, fight, Marquinhos fighting for a position as well. I think it's a great opportunity for those sort of players on the peripheral to make a mark. Um, so I'm I'm not too worried. And then again, you know, there's there's added ammunition there of people like Martinelli, who's really, really going to want a place in that, you know, Brazil squad. He's going to be playing out of his skin, I imagine. Um, and Ben White, he's going to be on a mission as well to try and get in that England squad. So I think, yeah, I think seeing it from a high motivation perspective rather than a you know potential for disaster i'm much more of a glass half um full kind of person so yeah. <laughs> i'm 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 excited rather than nervous at the moment but maybe talk to me two weeks into um yeah two weeks into october and see how i feel then when would you say that you were a glass half full person when it came to arsenal three years ago or has that changed because you've seen as you mentioned earlier green shoots well, do you know what? It's really difficult because I, so I'm in my late 20s. So I was really, really young during the Invincible season. Like, you know, up until I'd say 2010, it's it's quite hazy for me in terms of like what I remember. So yeah. my genuine like life as an Arsenal fan has been through the banter era. Like it's just been what I've been used to, like getting knocked out by like Bayern Munich in the Champions League, like ev by, in every group stage possible. Um, you know, I remember some of those like frantic January signings. It's kind of all I've been used to. So someone like my dad has been like constantly frustrated through like the last like 10 years, I would say. Whereas I'm like, I can only really see us getting better in like the last two years. So yeah, I kind of, it, yeah, it is difficult as well because I think whilst we've been maybe, we'd gone through that real dip and we're now getting stronger so many other teams around us have caught up. So it's just a really different landscape, I guess. I've gone from having that kind of initial feeling of Arsene Wenger is going to cobble together a team that's going to, you know, get into the top four regardless, to now starting every season being like, oh, look how, you know, Newcastle strengthened here. Or, you know, Brentford have made a good few signings, for example. That kind of fight for, I guess sort of top of the table does feel a lot closer now mm. so it's, it's a difficult position to be in I think because I just think the league is now is so much more competitive than I ever remember it I, I think you're right I think it is more competitive than ever I think you, you hit the nail on the head with clubs like Brentford who are able to go and spend you know 20 plus million pounds on a player when I was growing up watching Arsenal and I'm sort of in my early 30s I, I don't ever remember that being the situation it was Arsenal Manchester United and maybe, you know, you from here and there, you'd get a, a, another team sort of come out of the woodwork and get close to those. But it was always a, a two-horse race. And so as sort of Arsenal have, I don't want to use the term declined, but become less competitive, should we put it that way? Mm. It's been hard for me to, to sort of process the fact that, yes, the reason or, or part of the reason for that is because everybody else is getting stronger and there's now a race for the top four and there's probably six or seven clubs that are fighting for that every season and you know it's, it's hard to kind of recalibrate your thoughts but yeah I mean looking at the way Mikel Arteta has taken things and I must admit I've had wobbles during Mikel Arteta's time there's been times where I've looked at it and gone I don't know if this is going to work I don't know if we as a fan base have the patience I don't know if the club are going to have the patience and um and you know maybe it's it's time to kind of look elsewhere but I think we were right to give him the time I think we were right to give him the opportunity and right to back him in all the ways that we have, because it's not just been signing players. It's been getting rid of players as well. You know, the, the club have swallowed big costs in order to move players on that Mikel Arteta didn't feel were bringing anything to the squad. But what would happen in your eyes or, or how would you see it if Arsenal were to fail to make the Champions League again, given the backing that Mikel Arteta has had? I think I'd I'd feel really, you know, it would be really difficult to, I think, continue to support him because I think we do have we do have really good players now that I do think are capable of reaching top four. And I guess it, it does, you know, it's very early on in the season, but it kind of looks like a battle between, you know, could be a battle between us and Spurs again. And 
you know, I know a lot of Spurs fans are really frustrated at their spending over the summer. You know, they've looked at us and said, you have been consistently spending. Um, you know, we were, we were top in the European spending last season. And again, we've come quite close. Um, the club have, have probably at great expense got rid of a lot of players that we don't see fit. Even if that does take money off the, the wage bill, we've still had to pay people off and we still haven't got a lot of money for players. Whereas I guess Spurs have sold a lot better this summer. They haven't recruited as heavily. So you'd think our club has had more backing. The you know, the owners have backed us a lot more than the owners of Spurs have. So if if it's them, you know, if it's them that, that comes at the expense, you just think maybe the manager's not good enough. I think United's maybe a different situation because they've just thrown money at the, the situation and they've just brought in every top player they can find in every position that they need. But you know, when it comes down to kind of straight out skills and ability of the players, I really think that they're capable now. And it is just about coaching because they are so young. You can see that they are quite, you know, they can be quite an emotional side. You can really see that, you know, conceding goals or, you know, losing players, players getting booked can really, you know, change the emotions of the team and kind of change the feeling on the pitch. And you just think we need the right person to kind of, keep all those players on board really and I do yeah it does it does it does worry me but you know the players seem to absolutely love him you know from all or nothing from kind of you know what we're seeing what we're seeing now in games they seem to really back him really you know they really really support his judgment so he's getting something right with them so as long as that as long as that translates on the pitch you know I think we'll be okay but yeah there's, there's so many things that could go wrong, so many things that could go right, so many external factors with other with how other clubs are going to do. You know, it is so difficult to judge. Yeah, for sure. I think with the external factors, the way I try and look at it, and when I say external factors, I mean how other clubs are doing. I try mm. to block that out and, and just focus on what we're doing. And, and the reason for that is because it's really easy every summer to look at a club and go, well, look what they've done. They're definitely going to be above us. Look what they've done. They're, they're going to be really strong. And very often it doesn't work out like that, right? We've seen teams over the years that were expected to challenge for Premier League titles go off the wagon. We've seen teams that were expected to finish in the top four not make it. So I think you'll always get those cases. And so I think if you obsess over what everybody else is doing, you then sort of drift away from what your path should be. And I think you make panic decisions. And I think Arsenal have done that for years and years. And it's nice to see that even last January, I know people will say it cost us, but the fact that Arsenal didn't see anyone that they thought was worth going and breaking the bank for and decided to stick to the strategy rather than bow to the pressure. That that gave me encouragement. And again, you know, at the end of this summer transfer window, it wasn't, we've got to get one more in because the fans want it. It's, we'll look for one more. If we can find the right player, we'll do it. If we can't, then we'll make do with what we've got. So I take encouragement from the fact that they seem to have a plan and they're sticking with that plan. And they're, they're moving us forward. But I just want to pick up on, on a point you made about the emotion of the side. You said it's quite an emotional side. And mm. I completely agree with that. And I think there are times where the manager has been a little bit over-emotional as well. And perhaps given the wrong message off to the players. Now, a recent example of this for me was the game at Old Trafford just recently. You know, we, we went behind. We were unlucky to go behind. We had a goal chalked off that, you know, I think it probably was just about a foul, but you know, it, it was debatable. It was controversial. And yeah. we finally get ourselves back into the game after playing all the football. And for me, if I were the manager, I would have been like, right, we've come to Old Trafford. We're not getting beat. We've managed to pull ourselves back into this game. Let's just settle down for a bit and make sure that we don't undo the hard work that we've done in order to get back into this game. And I think the emotion and the, the intensity that Arteta kind of puts across and was like, you know, I was at the game and I could see him sort of urging everybody forward all the time. Sometimes there's a bit of naivety there. Sometimes you just need to rein it in a little bit, take the point, come away from Old Trafford. And all of a sudden, the narrative is totally different. It's Arsenal went to one of the big six and didn't get beat, as opposed to same old Arsenal played a decent side and ended up getting beaten again. So I think the emotion thing is is really important. But do you think that's something that Mikel Arteta will learn as he goes as a manager? Do you think these experiences will serve him well in the future? I think, you know, where, where you mentioned that sort of turning of the tide at Old Trafford, you know, going from 1-1 to 3-1, one, one, 
for me, it was all about substitutions. And I really think the manager sends a message to the team with the substitutions. And I do think in that instance, you know, if he would have, I've got no problems with the, the Rob Holding substitution, bring him on, sure up the defence. But, you know, by I think he brought off, did he, did he bring off, he brought off a right back and then sort of went yeah, to some made... sort of like weird hybrid back three um, with about six defenders, uh, sorry, like six attackers on the pitch. Um, and to me, that didn't necessarily send the right message to the team. I think we needed a kind of reassuring presence, maybe, you know, in holding, he's been at the club for a while. He's one of our longest standing players now, you know, bring him on, shore that defence up, stop, you know, stop that counter attack, which was just killing us from that moment onwards. And I think, you know, it would have been a lot more steady. I really understood the ambition that he was trying to show. And I do think a lot of the time that is the case with, with Arteta. He maybe overthinks it slightly. He's trying to be really ambitious. And I think sometimes just a little, you know, he again gets really pent up. You can see him on the sidelines. I know Richard Keyes likes to make jokes about him running up and down the touchline for games. But he does, he gets so into it. He gets so, you know, he's so animated. You kind of think if he calmed down a little bit, he's that reassuring presence on the sideline to the players. Like, it's fine. Everything's okay. Just stay calm. I do think that that might help. But yeah, kind of going back to that emotion side, he himself is fueling the fire sometimes, I think. Yeah. And, and and sometimes I think as a manager, it's your responsibility to keep your calm. You know, I expect players mm. thick of it out on the pitch to get a little bit over emotional sometimes and to react to things. But I think as a manager, especially when you've got a young bunch, I think you really do need to make sure that you, you, you portray calm at mm. certain points. Now, there are times where his emotion, his intensity, his urging of us to go forward has benefited us. It's why we start games like a house on fire nowadays, but there is just, you know, there is a bit of balance that's needed there, I would say. Um, Annabelle, just interested to know sort of your your journey into kind of following Arsenal. How did it come about? Um, a little bit about your career. Um, mm -hmm. you know, how's all of that going? Talk, talk to us a little bit about it. So, yeah, my dad is a, my dad is like a lifelong, like diehard Arsenal fan. Um, he was, he said he was going to games on his own at like 13 or 14, which now seems kind of inconceivable. The thought that like, he was like, I would have never let you do that. And I was like, but your mum and dad sort of let you get on the bus. Um, cause he grew up, he grew up in North London. So they let him get the bus to games at Highbury. Um, and he'd go home and away. And I just remember growing up, um, and yeah, my mum, my mum hates football. Like my mum doesn't know anything. So it would always make me laugh that my dad would kind of disappear on a Saturday or a Sunday, um, mostly a Saturday, um, and then sort of come back in the evening with like no voice or like freezing cold um, after like going, going to games. And he used to take me to a lot when I was little. Um, and I kind of remember like, kind of in my memory have like those early trips to Highbury. Um, but I would say like when I was, like it was probably my younger sister who was like really, really into football more than me. Um, and I'd say that I probably didn't really start watching Arsenal like week in, week out until I was about 18. So I've probably only really like religiously watched Arsenal games for about 10 years now. So it's quite interesting because I guess I don't really have that historical viewpoint that a lot of people have. Um, but yeah, I would say that I probably got hooked I probably got hooked in the, like the Meza Ozil like signing time because yeah. I feel like that was a really distinctive moment for the club having like Alexis and Ozil together. I feel like produced a lot of great memories and obviously like I think one of my one of my earliest is probably like going to well, I went to like a League Cup went to an FA Cup so I guess just getting into the club that way because I feel like even though we haven't won the league in a time that I've really been invested in the club, we still have won trophies, still got to European finals. Yeah. So I, I've still had kind of things to really look forward to, um, unlike sort of the other side of, of North London. <laughs> um, and, you know, I've, I've, I've always like, I've always just wanted to support the club. I think where I don't have that context of being used to winning and being used to being the best side in England I just get to kind of enjoy the small wins. So 
it yeah I'm kind of I guess it have a very different reference point to a lot of like fans who have been in the game for longer um but yeah I would say I'm aiming now I've I've been on the season ticket list for a while so that would be nice in the next couple of years because I do just get to go to games sort of as and when but I do go with my dad and my sister which is really nice we always go together the three of us um and we've got to enjoy some really good games together and in terms of my career I don't work in sports journalism although I used to um I like work for the BBC news like content teams now so kind of the specialist news teams um but I used to work for Radio 1 so I would do like okay. sport yeah I do like sport shifts there um and like covered the Champions League covered the shutdown in the Premier League um yeah have done a have done a few things covered the Newcastle takeover so it's kind of crossed over in a work capacity so getting to write for the Guna this season um is great I've got got to write my second column <laughs> after the Brentford game so I'm looking forward to that but yeah it's 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 weird because I don't um I don't really talk about football with anyone outside of my friends and family I don't really do it in a professional professional capacity but I'm always on hand as I said in my Guna column to defend the club <laughs> where it needs even if that's like in a in a queue for the bar or a pub, I'll always be ready to defend defend my club, um, which people which my friends will definitely attest to. Yeah, that that tribalism comes comes out, doesn't it? At certain moments, like for me as well, like I, I will sit on on this podcast and and I can talk about Arsenal and I can talk about maybe what went wrong and and what needs improving. The minute you put me in another environment where other fans are looking to have a go at Arsenal, I can't. I have to. I have to defend and I go into defence mode and I know that. And that's a bit of a problem in my job at times because uh, the <laughs> yeah. comment sections often fill up with uh, why is this biased guy on here talking about Arsenal? But, you know, you, you can't help it. You can't help uh, what you fall in love with, I guess. Um, would you be interested in in going back into like sports for full time sort of thing? Is that something that you look at in the future or, or do you like having that little bit of distance between what you're doing and what your hobby is? Because I found the transition of going from a job that had nothing to do with Arsenal to one that is literally only about Arsenal at times made me feel the lows even more, but also makes you feel the highs more because you're in and around it all of the time. Do you like the fact that there's a little bit of distance between what you do professionally and the football, even though there is a, a touch of a crossover? Yeah, it's, it's a weird one, really, because I feel like I've got like specialisms in my job and things that in journalism I, I know a lot about and I'm really interested in. So it feels weird that football probably comes as close to that in terms of my knowledge base. And also the amount of time I spend outside work actually, you know, reading, watching, listening, you know, to stuff about Arsenal is probably the same to kind of the capacity of my other interests that I then get to write about and do radio packages about for work. So is it's definitely something I'd be interested in. It's more just like, I always think that I like, there's so much that I could know about football that I don't. Like I will watch games and I will, you know, I'll have my own insights. I'll kind of, you know, I'll, I'll take away what I can from a game and I'll be certainly interested in it. But there's like, there's aspects of the game I'm more interested in than others. Or I'm naturally better at because of, I think, just the way that my brain works. So it, it's difficult, really. It's kind of, I'm now testing the water. So I'm kind of seeing if I enjoy writing about Arsenal, talking about Arsenal, could I do it all the time? I feel like it's a good, it's good to kind of, yeah, dip my toe in the water and see if I like it. Because I'm not, I'm not sure yet. It's hard. It is. It, it is a hard balance to find. It really is. And, and also, I, I find I can't switch off from it ever like and okay it's it's something that I'd be all over anyway as a big Arsenal fan but mm -hmm. to be able to kind of have that distance when I need it I think is is the one thing I probably miss um I've got to be honest like for example I'll go and cover a game I'm going to cover a game on Saturday that doesn't involve Arsenal and that for me is nice because I still get to enjoy and appreciate the football and can look at the football for what it is without any of the emotion and any of the kind of baggage that you're left with once you've gone home. Um, the type of thing that Arsenal gives you, basically. So, yeah, um, I totally get where you're coming from. And, um, yeah, uh, hopefully we can have you on here more often as well. 
uh, talking Arsenal would be brilliant. Um, Annabelle, thank you so, so much. I, I really appreciate it because I know you're really busy as well. So it's great to have you. Um, how can people uh, follow you on social media and keep up with the great work you do? Um, so you can see my really bad takes on football games on my Twitter account. Um, my handle is at Annabelle Lamore. Um, I would say I'm not, I, uh, my Instagram is not very football related. So if you want any football content there and then, um, all my, um, my Guna, I think my Guna article has just gone onto the Guna website so you can read it there or you can get a subscription to the magazine. So I know the next edition is coming out soon. Um, and yeah, if you search up my name, you can read all my articles that I write for the BBC, uh, listen to some of my radio packages. I've made a documentary. So yeah, I think I've got like a page. It comes up or it should come up on Google search and you'll be able to see all that there. Nice one. Make sure you do check it out, people. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in as well. Don't forget to leave a like on the video. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're new. And if you're listening on the audio platforms, please do leave us a review. We'll be back very, very soon with more. Until next time, take care. Cheers. <laughs>